Hi, my name is Andy Tidy and welcome back to another episode of Canal Hunter. If you are eagerly awaiting the next instalment of Brindley's Birmingham Canal taking us through from Birmingham to Wolverhampton, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Inclement weather and other commitments means that I haven't been able to complete that project, but fear not, it will be along very soon. Stay tuned. But by way of a change, I have come up north to Yorkshire. I've come to have a look at the Ripon Canal, the short 2.3 mile canal that was built to join the River Ewer into the town of Ripon. Not a great success as waterways go, but nonetheless it does form one of the furthest outposts of the integrated waterway network. It's at the very northeast end. And it fully justifies its IWA silver propeller status location. If you get your boat up to here, you really have won your spurs. Street. But a bit about the history of this waterway before we start to explore it. It was conceived back in the late 1700s, very much during the era of canal mania. And the people of Ripon wanted to be in on the action, so they decided they'd like to make a connection through to York and then beyond. To achieve this, they used the River Ouse and then the River Ewer but they were still two and a half miles short of their destination. So for that, they decided a canal was needed. William Jessop, the canal engineer, was employed to build this one. And by 1773, he had built all the way through to a small canal basin in Ripon, including three locks along the way. This canal is built to broad dimensions. It's that classic northern dimension of 57 feet long by 14 feet wide. It was, and it was capable of carrying the river going craft, which frequent the Humber estuary. This waterway could be classed as a country canal because they mostly carried butter and cheese and bricks and a little bit of lead. And they brought some coal in from the South Yorkshire coal field. But then, of course, it's the usual story. In 1838, the Leeds and Thirsk Railway rocked into town. They brought in cheaper coal from the Durham coal field. And by then, the waterway was largely redundant. It languished on in varying states of disrepair over the decades, but by 1892 it was by and large finished and formally abandoned in 1956. So if the canal was abandoned in about 1900, how come it's navigable today and how come it's got the IWA Silver Propeller Award for a navigation all the way through to Ripon Basin? Well, that is where the story of the Ripon Motorboat Club comes in. Now it's true to say that the Ripon Motorboat Club and the Ripon Canal have over the years become inextricably intertwined. Had there been no failure of the canal, the Motorboat Club would never have existed. And had the Motorboat Club not existed, the canal would never have been restored. But all that is a bit further back up the canal. So let me show you the Ripon Canal as it is today and I'll tell you the story as we go along. At this point, I have to acknowledge that I've made extensive references to the historical account of the RMBC's activities as written by Pat Jones 20 years ago. And it's all published on the club's website if you care to go and take a look. This fascinating story starts with something of an accident in 1931 when two boats, the Onway and the Vagabond, made a bit of a pioneering journey up from the River Derwent. They came to have a look at this Ripon Canal and see what was still here. Unfortunately, they soon met with problems as they came off the River Ewer. As they tried to rise up through the first lock at Oxclose, they noticed that the gates at the bottom were bulging and bending. Well, they decided to carry on, but as they were getting the boats out of the top of the lock, the bottom gates burst completely. As a result, the two boats managed to scramble out, tie themselves to trees and anchor themselves to the bank. But sadly, of course, the lock behind them was destroyed and they found themselves trapped in this pound. It wasn't long till the farmer who owned the land to the left here, uh, Farmer Nicholson, came along to see what was up and presumably to encourage them to move on. But of course, they could go nowhere. They tried going upstream, only to discover that the next lockup was in an even worse state than the one at the bottom. So they were stuck for the duration. Farmer Nicholson said, well, a guy was up here a couple of years ago. He bit of a, built a bit of a landing jetty. Why don't you put your boats on there? And that's what they did. And basically, 
they never left. It was at the same time that the River Derwent went into flood and washed out all of its locks and there was a bit of an exodus of boats from the Derwent looking for somewhere to stop. The uh, story of the dramatic escape from the collapsing lock spread far and wide and word got out that there was a nice safe haven up here on the lower end of the Ripon Canal. And so the membership of this little band who moored on Farmer Nicholson's land continued to grow and grow. And then of course the war years intervened and no one was moving their boats anywhere. But people kept coming to bring their boats here into a safe haven. And even during the war years they needed to maintain them. So the dry dock that they had created, or the slipway should I say, continued to be used and it kept the club afloat financially. Had it not been for the Ripon Motorboat Club, I don't think this section of canal would ever have survived. It certainly wasn't being used commercially and it wasn't included as part of the nationalisation programme in the late 1940s. As a result of the club's activities, this section above Lock 1 and below Lock 2 remained used and in water. But after the 1930s there were no boats able to progress any further and the section up to the basin in Ripon became completely unusable. Whilst the presence of the boat club ensured the survival of the lower portion of the canal, the same wasn't the case for the upper section through the next two locks and up to the basin at the end. Back in 1937, the last 12 boats from the boat club made their way up to the basin. But then the war intervened, the canal fell into rack and ruin and no more passages could be made. It was to take them another 33 years to start the process of getting the canal reopened and then another 26 to actually achieve that end. And then finally, after this long period, a symbolic dozen boats came up from the Ripon Boat Club all the way up to the basin and re-enacted that final journey from back in the 1930s. That amicable relationship with Farmer Nicholson continued over the years and through the generations. And over time, the club continued to buy extra portions of land and dig larger and larger moorings until they've reached the 144 that you can see today. Now, whilst I have never visited this navigation before, I've always been aware of the Ripon Motorboat Club because they were the publishers of a series of navigation booklets covering the Trent and the Ouse books which I have continued to use to this day to navigate my way around the shoals of the tidal Trent. I was therefore really keen to visit this canal which is their home base and also the holder of one of the recent Green Flag Awards for CRT. And I think it's fair to say that this may be one of the shortest canals in Yorkshire but it's also possibly one of the prettiest. Well worth a visit if ever you get a chance, preferably by boat but if not by foot.
so we reach the end of the diminutive Ripon Canal. It's as you come into the town you realise that although it may have a cathedral, it has none of the heavy industry which is necessary to support a successful canal. It's therefore a little surprise that it never really lived up to expectations. That said, this may be short but it's sweet. It's a lovely little canal and well worth a visit. It's certainly one that I'll keep on my bucket list. Anyhow, for now, goodbye from Canal Hunter and I will see you back on the BCN very soon. Cheerio.